Daniela, for turning off. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> so, I'm Eleni. I'm an IOS engineer at Scrooge. Uh, let me briefly, briefly introduce myself. Hello, my name is Eleni Panikolopoulou, and I am an IOS engineer at Scrooge. Scrooge started as a price comparison engine, but has nowadays evolved to one of the biggest e-commerce platforms in Greece, helping millions of registered users carry out their online shopping on a daily basis. And today, I'm going to talk to you about diversifying the community. Okay, that was not very loud. But anyway, <laughs> the emoji looks like pay, doesn't seem. <laughs> So let me guide you through the agenda of today's presentation. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about what diversity and DEI is. Then we're going to talk about how close are we into acknowledging the problem, which is the lack of diversity in the IS community. And we're going to discuss about the root causes. Then we're going to see some statistical data about the underrepresented groups. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience and then we're going to see what companies uh, can do in order to increase diversity, what can individuals do, and what Apple has done in order to increase diversity. So, what is meant by diversity in a work team? Team diversity refers to the differences or variations between individuals in relevance with multiple factors, such as age, nationality, ethnicity, education, gender, religious background, sexual orientation, political preferences, and cultural heritage. So we see that there are so many different aspects of diversity. Uh, and in the recent years, the term DEI has emerged as a crucial topic among companies. So DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is, can be very tangibly measured, so it's basically the specific percentage of employees' workforce that correspond to the characteristics I, I outlined before. And it can be measured through company audits or employee surveys. Equity uh, refers to the, um, about, it's about pro, uh, giving the same lev uh, level of access to the various disadvantaged groups, and about, it's about closing the pay gap. So equity, uh, it's, more about, um, it's more about proactively seeking to support and mentor the disadvantaged groups. And it, at its most basic level, can be measured in terms of salary and perks and benefits. Uh, but also companies can take various measures in terms of in relevance with equity uh, that have to do with personal training, uh, mentorship programs, creating a diverse and inclusive leadership, etc. Uh, finally, inclusion is a, um, it's rather more abstract than concrete. So inclusion, uh, it's about it's the sense of belonging, or of uh, support, of uh, valued and respected by a company. So it's about creating a company culture that nourishes these feelings to its employees. Um, so it's, about, uh, more, it's more about create, creating a psychologically safe environment for the employees. Uh, so your, your diverse teams can work together seamlessly and effortlessly. And amidst uh, the spike of awareness in the recent years about diversity, there has been the publication of various um, lessons created by experts that companies have actually adopted in order to create sustainable long-term uh, DEI strategies. And the variation of DEI is DNI, which stands for diversity and inclusion, but it's basically the same thing. So why is diversity important? It's only logical that if you have people with different perspectives, you will have more ideas on the table. And more ideas on the table means better ideas and better decisions and more effective problem solving. There has been a Harvard business study that showcases that uh, teams with more cognitive diversity solve problems better and faster. But what is it exactly, cognitive diversity? So it has to do about the different perspective and the information process style uh, with new, uncertain, complex situations. And the study showcases that teams with uh, more cognitive diversity, that cognitive diversity in teams directly correlates with better performance. Um, also, when you have uh, people with different viewpoints and life experiences, uh, they will be more creative because, because there, will, there will be also diversity in thought. Um, additionally, a diverse team can better serve the needs of better of a uh, 
of a diverse customer base. Trust me, you will fail to create software that addresses people with different cultures, ages, genders, if you don't have a diverse software team. Because how can you expect your, your, to create software that your users can identify with if you don't know your users' own experiences? Uh, so it's pretty self-explanatory. In order to create diverse software, you need a diverse software engineers. Finally, employees want to feel included and respected, and diversity creates this uh, feeling of inclusion and respect. Um, only when, uh, when employees can work in a psychologically safe environment can reach their full potential and bring the uh, benefits of diversity into light. Um, also, the data show the positive business e impact of diversity and leadership. According to a McKinsey study, uh, companies that are more concerned about diversity, about gender diversity at the executive level, are 21% more likely to generate higher profits and 27% more likely to have superior value creation. Uh, also, companies that are more concerned about diversity, about ethnic diversity uh, on the executive level are one-third percent more likely to have industry-leading profitability. So it's evident that uh, diversity in leadership uh, cr uh, means for companies more revenue. So now that we established that diversity is important, how do you think, how close are, you, are we, do you think, into acknowledging the problem, which is the lack of diversity in the community? The first step is to identify which are the underrepresented groups in iOS community and software engineering in general. So first we have women, then we have people of color like African American, Asian, Hispanic, etc. Then we have uh, combining these two, we have women of color, and then we have the members of the LGBTQ plus community like non-binary, gender fluid, and we have people with disabilities and people with uh, and age minorities like baby boomers because how many 50 year old 60 year old software engineers do you actually know so now let's see some statistical data about these underrepresented groups according to the office of national statistics women make up 31% of staff in the technology industry and the percentage drops to 18% when it comes to software developers web designers and data analysts According to coding black females in the UK, the African-American women make up only 1.8% of the workforce and only 0.7% of them are working in technology. Various companies like N26 stated that only 10% of the iOS team was non-female before taking any action. Some more data. According to globaldata.com, in Microsoft, the African-American employees represent 5.6%, and Hispanic and Latinx employees 3.7% at senior levels in year 2021. And according to a study from Mercer, 85% of the US-based executives and 83% of senior managers are white. Also, according to the same study, 77% of executives and 71% of senior managers worldwide are male. So you can see that uh, worldwide, the people on the executive level are mainly white male people. Finally, according to Bloomberg, while Hispanics make 18% of the US population, they only represent 8% of employees in big tech companies. And while the same percentage for African Americans in the US population is 13%, only 5% of them hold uh, big tech jobs. So seeing these figures, you can understand that although companies have gone a long way and undeniably there is a momentum, it's not the scale that we might think. And there is this mistaken notion among boardrooms that the problem is fixed, uh, but the, the data show otherwise. This is a graph that is uh, published by Global Data that show the, shows the women representation at Apple. So on the right column, we see women representation in senior management. And on the left column, we see women representation among all employees. So we can notice here that in year 2021, uh, women representation among all Apple employees is 34.8%. And the same percentage for, uh, women, um, for women in senior management at Apple is 
What we can also notice here that in the period of four years, there has been an, a 1.8% increase. And the same percentage for uh, uh, women in uh, senior management is 1.4%, which is relatively low, especially if we consider the many initiatives that Apple has taken in order to increase diversity. And we'll talk afterwards about these initiatives. Tim Cook himself, he said, he commented about gender representation at Apple. So he gave an interview in the BBC last December, and he told, quote, I'm worried about the lack of women in tech, and there are no good excuses for it. He also said that we cannot achieve nearly what we could achieve without a more diverse workforce. And finally, that I think the essence of technology and its effect on humanity depends upon women being at the table. This is a, grab, uh, a chart by Global Data that shows ethnic representation at Apple. So we can see that an astonishing 43.8% are white people, whereas a meager 9.4% um, is black and African American. So we can see also the gender discrepancies at Apple. And what I want to says here is that uh, all of these data, you can find it in Apple's website under the diversity web page. But uh, no matter how hard I try, I, I searched, I couldn't find any data about the representation of the LGBTQ plus community, which is pretty strange because I know for a fact that Apple is very uh, friendly towards this community. So I'm just wondering why. Um, this is a graph published by Marathon VC, which is a Greek-based venture capital that shows the gender ratios per job family. So they question 27 companies employing a total of 1,915 employees in Greece. And you can, you can see that in some, gender, uh, in some uh, job families, like product and design and QA and testing, the women representation is pretty good, around 50%. Whereas in some other job families, like um, DevOps infrastructure and engineering mobile, the, the women representation is 0%. Obviously, I didn't take that sur the survey that day. But what I also want to highlight here, that we don't only have a gender gap, we also have a gender pay gap. Uh, this is a chart that is published by Eurostat concerning the gender pay gap in the European countries. So some countries like Luxembourg, Romania, Slovenia, Italy, and Poland have a relatively low pay gap, which is around 5%. Whereas some other countries like Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Estonia, and Latvia have a, a really uh, high pay, uh, pay gap, around 20%, which is not something you would expect from countries like Germany and Switzerland and Austria, right? According to the House of Commons, the average weekly pay for female full-time employees in the UK was uh, 558 pounds at April 2021, compared to a 652 pounds for males. So we see here that there is around 100, uh, pay, uh, 100 pounds discrepancy between male and female for the same job. Uh, there are many reasons for it, uh, one of it being the overrepresentation of women in relatively low paying sectors, such as care, health, and education. So, although we have an underrepresentation in the technology, we see that there is an overrepresentation in other sectors, which unfortunately are low paying. Uh, the, also, the position in hierarchy influences the level of pay, which means if you have less p women in the leadership lowers, the higher the pay, pay gap will be. Uh, what is also interesting is that the larger differences in early earnings in Europe are basically for managers, with a 23% lower earnings for women than men. All of this happening, where the equal, although the Equal Pay Act was enshrined in 1963 from the European Union, basically main, making pay discrimination legal. So... Now that we saw all these figures, how close are we really into acknowledging the problem? Because if you are, for example, a white, straight, well-off, well-educated man, how uh, likely is it, do you think, that you will notice that around you there are mainly white, straight, male engineers? Not very likely. And this is because as human beings, we all have the tendency that if the problem doesn't concern us directly, we tend to ignore it or lower its significance. 
uh, and this is exactly what this chart shows. So they asked employees if DEI is personally important topic for you. And we see here the responses by gender. So we see that 65% said that yes, it has always been an issue for me in comparison with 73.3% for women. And 12.3% said that it has never been an important issue for me. So we can see here again the gender discrepancies when it comes to acknowledging the problem. Now, uh, what are the root causes? So many reasons. First, we don't have uh, enough relatable role models and references. We saw earlier that the uh, percentages of women in leadership roles are pretty low in comparison with the corresponding uh, percentages of male in these roles. And also, women state that they don't see themselves in higher positions in universities. Um, also, students state that they have never had a woman a mentor in their undergraduate studies. Um, also, um, um, we don't know many, many well-known uh, personalities of uh, the computer science, like, for example, um, Ada Lovelace, who was the 19th century mathematician, who was a pioneer of computer science, or Grace Hopper, also a very important uh, contributor of computer science, or Margaret Hamilton. These are personalities that we should be aware of, and we're not. Also, there has been a study from University of Alabama that states that uh, there are not enough women scientists references in books. And um, the professors say that it will be centuries until, uh, the, uh, until uh, the books match the diversity of the readers. Also, there is this human mentality that there are more feminine and masculine professions. So little girls from an early age are not guided to pursue uh, careers in technology because it's not considered a feminine profession. And uh, you might think that this is not the case in our days, but uh, it is still the case, especially in some underdeveloped countries. Um, according to a Girls Guiding Organization uh, survey, uh, uh, girls aged between the age of 10 and 18 uh, considered the STEM subjects, science, technology, and math, to be primarily for men. And according to the CEO of Girls Who Code, she said that there is a uh, very emerging uh, danger that girls are labeled during their school years by their parents or professors, and this can have a detrimental effect in their confidence and their later choice of career. And this, by extension, leads to not enough computer science students. Only 20% of computer science students are women, and 40% of them do not pursue a career in software engineering. Um, Tim Cook himself, he said that we should fundamentally change the number of people that are taking on computer science and programming lessons. And this, by extension, leads to another diverse talent pool from which the companies can draw their candidates. And this is the number one reason why they are, we don't have diversity. Also, there is this imposter syndrome that many people, uh, many times, we feel that we are not qualified enough or we're not worthy enough to be in, uh, in a company to work as programmers or to be in a room full of accomplished male engineers. And the lack of confidence is very characteristic, especially from people that are coming from disadvantaged groups. Uh, very important, there is this unconscious bias. Do you think that we can actually make biased decisions without even realizing it? Science says yes. Um, many, times, uh, many times our brain makes decisions based on stimulation and we don't even realize it. And these decisions can also be hiring decisions. So hiring managers tend to employ candidates uh, that have the same or similar attributes or characteristics with them because they think they will get along better with them. Also, many times hiring managers make decisions based, for example, in a, a resume photo or a candidate's hometown or hobbies. Uh, may, this shows that, we, that uh, people, um, hiring managers employ candidates based on criteria that are totally irrelevant with the jobs. And this can cost companies very precious candidates. Also, there is the lack of sponsorship because people that come from underrepresented groups very often do not have the financial uh, um, what do not have the financial resources to uh, pursue a career in technology. And sponsorships are very important for these people to help them make ends meet and educate themselves. 
Also, there is this AI bias, um, especially in the recent years. There is this emerging concern that uh, uh, that um, AI st systems display a certain level of bias, uh, which actually is, it's the underlying prejudice uh, in the data that fuel the AI algorithms. And there are many uh, real life examples. Uh, Amazon uh, recently admitted that their hiring algorithm uh, showed the discrimination against women, like Paul also mentioned before. And uh, um, th which this is the reason for this discrimination was the fact that it was based on uh, the resumes that they accepted the past 10 years. And these resumes were uh, mostly for men. Also, there is the lack of real know-how in companies. Many companies state that they simply don't know what to do in order to increase diversity and how to create a sustainable DEI strategy. And this is exactly what this uh, chart shows. So they asked employees what are the major challenges your company faces in meeting the state DEI targets. And 39.1% 39, 30, uh, 39 said that the major challenge was to create a sustainable strategy that lasts over time. And a great percent that's replied that it's the lack of talent pool in industry and lack of talent pool in location, like we said earlier. So now I'm going to say a little words about my own experience as a female iOS engineer. So these are the photos from my teams uh, on a daily stand-up. So on the left, you can see my feature team. And on the, uh, on the right, you can see my chapter team. Uh, so I'm hiding the faces, obviously, for GDPR regions and names, but you can tell from the, fig from the figures that in both cases, the only female is me. So the ratio in my feature team is one out of five, and the ratio in my chapter team is one out of eight. There were two people missing the day I took the photo in my chapter team. Um, and this is a photo from the whole mobile team. So Android uh, engineers and iOS engineers gathered together with backend developers and PMs. And we had our Secret Santa event last December. And you can tell from the figure that there is one more girl that's standing next to me. So this is uh, our product manager, who unfortunately resigned last month. So <laughs> that's my luck, right? I'm left again alone. So the ratio is one out of 16. So you can see that in all cases, the common denominator is one. So am I used to it? I definitely am. So from uh, my studies in electrical and computer engineering, there were not a lot of electrical en female electrical engineers. And then in my postgraduate studies in the University of Manchester in the UK, the situation was a little bit th better there. Uh, but uh, still not a lot of female computer scientists. And in every single uh, company I've worked so far, the situation is the same. So am I used to it? I am definitely am. Do I feel good about it? I don't. And there are many reasons why I don't feel good about it. Because being in a room or a meeting full of male engineers creates this pressure. The pressure to prove yourself. The pressure uh, to prove that you deserve to be in the room, uh, in a room full of accomplished male engineers, and this happens to me, especially the first days that I joined the company. Um, also, the, during the early years of my career, when I used to go to interviews, um, I used to pretend to be someone else. What I, do I mean by that? So I used to be much blonder back then. So I used to gather my hair in a ponytail and try to hide the blonde part as much as we can. I always wear my glasses, even though I didn't have to at the time. I had zero makeup, and I used to dress down. So practically, I was trying to present myself as nerdy as I could in order to make people get me seriously if about the job. Because the minute you, you enter a room, the people form an idea about you based on your appearance. And then it's up to you to dissolve the doubts that you're a good, good engineer or a good enough engineer. Also, uh, another story is that uh, in a conference I was recently, a person that I really admire and respect uh, came to me and told me that I dressed too fancy for a nice engineer. And I'm sure he meant it as a compliment, or I'm sure he meant it as a joke because he's the best. But uh, I'm wondering, isn't it an appropriate thing to say to a female engineer? Would you say something like this to a male engineer? I don't think so. 
And I, I recognize that sometimes it's very hard to be politi politically correct about everything. It was pretty hard for me to be politically correct in this presentation about everything. But sometimes we just have to pay attention. Also, uh, being in a room uh, or a meeting full of male engineers create a pressure to be a role model. Because when you are in a stage room like this, you become the very representation that I'm talking about through my talk. And uh, you try to live up to the expectations that rise and you feel obligated to speak about these things and, uh, and raise your objections when an injustice takes, takes place. And uh, I also always have to adapt to male discussions, which sometimes it's okay. Don't, don't get me wrong, I get along great with my colleagues. They are the best, they respect me, they treat me very good, and I enjoy spending time with them. But sometimes I'm just missing the feminine discussions. I, um, I once popped the question to them, how would you feel if you would be the single male engineer among eight, among eight or 16 female engineers? Uh, so the immediate response I got for them is, I would feel super, I would feel great <laughs> that we all know where it comes from and what they mean exactly. But trust me, if you have to spend every single, like eight hours per day, every single day of every single week, of every single month, for the rest of your life, with people from the opposite gender, trust me, it's not ideal, to say the least. So what do you think companies can do in order to make the ICE community more inclusive? There are so many things that companies can actually do. First, there should be more entry-level positions because when there are more entry-level positions, more people will start be interested in computer science because they will realize that it's easier for them to get a job. And also hiring managers should try to understand that they should be more open about the uh, educational background of people when they hire um, people for junior positions. And they should not be very uh, strictly minded when they to, to hire people that only come from computer science studies. Also, companies should provide the equipment because we all live in within the Apple workforce and we all know that Apple devices cost a fortune. So many people that have, and many times people don't have the uh, financial resources to buy the MacBooks that they need in order to um, start iOS development. So companies should provide this equipment. This is a, a study from Business of Apps, that a chart that shows that in the App developer market in India consists primarily from Android developers. So 65% of Android developers in India, uh, of developers in India are Android, whereas 21% of developers are iOS, and 10% are both an Android and iOS. And this directly correlates to the economic factor. Also, companies should use more inclusive and gender-neutral language in their formal communication job descriptions. Uh, how many times do we say, hey folks, or hey guys, especially hey guys is something I say all the time to my team. But it's not correct because when you say, when you say this, you're just not considered about other people in the room. Also, companies should track representation in their current workforce because how, how can companies take matter, measures that actually matter if they don't know where they stand now when it comes to representing, representation in their current workforce? Uh, so only then they can uh, establish a baseline and identify the pain points in order to uh, understand what measures they can take. Also, companies should try, uh, should try to train existing employees to code in iOS. So instead of uh, trying to find a diverse uh, talent pool, they can turn to their own employees. So companies can turn to the women in, uh, in, in, in their workforce or the people of color and train them, have introductory workshops, for example, in iOS development. Also, companies should make diversity priority in the hiring process. Now, this is something that we discussed a lot, but how can they actually do this? First, they can reach out to organizations such as Girls Who Code or Code.org. There are so many organizations out there that support uh, uh, these underrepresented groups. So we can, they can directly collaborate with these organizations in order to find their diverse candidates. Also, companies should make public statements that company is open to diverse candidates because sometimes this is not very obvious. And uh, statements like this do matter. 
Also, companies should explore a new candidate sources. For example, they can turn to the recruiters inside the company and tell them to directly reach out to diverse candidates through LinkedIn, for example. Also, uh, additionally, companies should make data-driven hiring decisions. For example, they can collect anonymized applicant data and establish candidate demographics in order to identify the channels that bring them more diverse candidates. Uh, all, finally, uh, companies can identify biases during the whole recruitment cycle and take action be because there is a mistaken notion that uh, bias happens only during the hiring stage. But this is not the case. Bias appears from, um, from the uh, recruitment uh, strategy until they get people on board. So in my previous company, Workable, uh, Workable is basically a hiring tool. So uh, we had the, we implemented this feature that was designed specifically to tackle bias. So y the feature was that you could not see the other person's written evaluation of an interview until you write your own evaluations uh, in order not to base an opinion of a candidate based on the other interviewer. And I'm proud enough to say that I was part of the implementation of this feature. Uh, moreover, companies should provide training to enable team members to overcome unconscious biases at their day-to-day -day work, because sometimes we show bias and we don't realize it. For example, I've heard many stories that uh, a person in a room addresses only the male engineers and completely ignores the female engineer. And sometimes we do things like this and we don't realize it. Uh, so companies can, ho can hold uh, training sessions to bring uh, to, the, to their employees' attention all of these things. Uh, N26 posted a blog that uh, where they um, described they held a workshop uh, focused on communication uh, where they taught em their employees that um, uh, that passionate debate is not the most constructive way to resolve uh, team issues and that you that employees should leave space to everyone in a meeting or in a room to talk and express their opinions. Um, Moreover, companies can create employee support groups for the disadvantaged employees in order to directly support these groups. And they can provide mentorship for career growth. Many women state that they don't see a clear path in their current positions in their current companies. And the lack of mentorship is a hurdle for them in order to pursue promotions. They can also employ a diversity and inclusion manager. This is an actual position with actual responsibilities, like, for example, creating a company policies for in, in order to tackle harassment uh, in the workplace. And they can also be an equal uh, opportunity employer, which means they should abide by the equal employment opportunity uh, legislation, which makes dis discrimination uh, legal. So there you can see that there are so many things that company can actually do. But what can we as individuals do in order to encourage diversity? We should always have in the back of my mind, of our minds, that we create software that addresses everyone and speak up when we see something inappropriate or injustice taking place. So not only companies, but us also, so, you, so we should use more inclusive language in our daily meetings. So no more, hey folks. We should also change mentality. Uh, we should stop ignoring the problem and start uh, taking actual measures in order to support the disadvantaged groups. So teach your daughters that technology is for them. Support your wives in your high demanding roles. And try to dismantle the negative stereotypes that exist around uh, careers in technology, like for example that it's too difficult and uh, people cannot do it. It's not, it's a normal job. Also, apply for jobs even when you don't meet the criteria 100%. We saw earlier that the imposter syndrome exists and sometimes we feel that we cannot do it and we don't deserve and we shouldn't apply in a job if we don't meet all, all the criteria. Don't do this, just get out there. They might see the potential in, in you. We have, we have seen so many stories. Also apply to speak in conferences, because uh, I know for a fact that conference organizers try to have a diverse speaker line, but they struggle to find one. And uh, our, our article, we're saying that in the call for papers for IS uh, conferences specifically, 90% of the submissions are from men and only 10% from women. So do it. And respect each other's space.
be an active listener and democratize debate by giving round drummings, for example, in a meeting and uh, let everyone speak and express their opinions. Respect each other's space and time, very important. So there are so many organizations that support diversity out there and you can directly reach out to these organizations if you feel you need any guidance or any support or try to find a job. So what Apple has done in order to encourage diversity. First, they updated the App Store review guidelines stating that the apps should not include content that is defamatory, discriminatory, or mean-spirited content, including references or commentary about religion, race, sexual orientation, gender, national, and ethnic origin. And they also they updated the Swift Code of Conduct to be more inclusive and uh, urged app developers to use more welcoming and inclusive languages, being respectful of different viewpoints and experiences, focus on what is best for the community and show empathy towards other community members. This is directly extracted from the Swift Code of Conduct. And also there is a sp under the Swift Code of Conduct, there is a special diversity section who states that its mission is to create more pathways for a diverse group of developers, increases in the engagement and retention of those developers, and helping developers of all backgrounds establish leadership and technical expertise within the community. Also under this diversity section, they created the specific three specific community work, group, work groups, which are Women in Swift, Black in Swift, and Pride in Swift. And they hold virtual events and meetups for networking. And uh, there are community phase, there's a community phase blog under Swift.org, and there's also a forum where they brainstorm ideas for the for the blog. And these are uh, the people that uh, consist the diversity work group. We see many well-known personalities of the community. Paul Hudson is here among us today. So you can directly reach out to these people if you want anything to discuss. Also, in August 2021, Apple made an additional 30 million commitment to their racial equity and justice initiative. And last year, they launched a new App Store Foundations program in the UK, which is specifically intended to support women developers and founders. And during these sessions, women developers and founders can directly speak to a person from Apple and guide, give them guidance on how to establish their uh, businesses. But apart from Ample, all big tech companies are very uh, concerned about diversity. So they gathered all together and they signed the Catalyze Tech Report, which basically is a report about the representation of employees in the Silicon Valley. And last November, I think it was, they held their first DI Innovation Summit, uh, where they discussed their report and they uh, pledged themselves and their companies accountable. So I want to finish up by giving a special thanks to Natasha Murasev. So unless you're living under a rock, we all know Natasha, or maybe you know her as Natasha the Robot. So she's the organizer of the Tri Swift uh, uh, conferences around the world. So I want to thank her for two reasons. The first reason is that she was one of the very first people from the community that pushed hard for diversity. And which comes down to the second reason I want to uh, thank her is that she was the first person that ever asked me to present in a conference. So long story short, uh, I met Natasha in Pragma conference in uh, Verona in Italy around six years ago. Uh, so we talked a little bit, I was an attendee there. And some months later, she sent me an email t asking me if I want to present in TriSwift New York. So. The moment I accept this email, I was so happy on the one hand, but on the other hand, I, w on the other hand, I was so terrified. And uh, because this was something so difficult for me. Uh, I was just, I think, around 26, 27 years old. I had only two uh, years of experience in iOS development. I have never traveled to the US before, and I have never presented to a large audience before. So this was tremendously frightening for me. But on the other hand, I knew that it was, this was not an opportunity I should pass on because I knew that it, it would never come up again. So what I did is that I came up with a middle ground solution, with, which was to have a co-presenter. So I asked one of my colleagues if he wanted to present with me and he accepted. And then when I asked Natasha, she, oh, she said yes. And the reason I'm telling this story is because I want to make a point. And the point I want to make is that 
you should just get out of your comfort zones, get out there, try new things, experiment with things. Don't hesitate. You'd never know where they le might lead you. For me, they led me in this very staging, stage presenting now. So next year, I want to see every one of you in this stage presenting. And I want to finish with a quote from Winston Churchill that said that diversity is the one true thing we all have in common. Celebrate every day. And I want to say that I see a bright future ahead. Companies have gone a long way. They have gone from uh, just saying that it's the cool thing to say uh, to actually doing things. So I see a bright future ahead. Let's increase those percentages. Thank you.